Hello and welcome to this reflection from Strettonville Baptist Church. We've seen Jesus's authority as a teacher in the f weeks one to four. And last time we saw Jesus's authority as a healer. And now it all comes to a head as we see Jesus's authority being exercised as Lord. Jesus is the one whose authority we should acknowledge over our own lives over the entirety of our lives. So I'm going to read um, from Matthew 8 verses 18 to 22. When the crowd saw Je well, sorry, when Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. Then a teacher of the law came to him and said, "Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go." Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another disciple came to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. So Jesus had been teaching and healing in the area for a while, and now he makes an attempt to move to another area which seems to stimulate a number of people to step forward, wanting to come, continue on with Jesus. But Jesus' response to these people makes it apparent that they were not truly prepared to fully commit and submit to Jesus' authority above all else. They wanted to be mere followers, not disciples. It might be tempting to sit back and criticise these would-be disciples for their lack of true commitment, but we need to examine ourselves and ask, are we any different? Do we commit everything under Jesus' lordship? Do we genuinely follow and submit to Jesus as our master who guides our every step? Do we sacrifice everything for him? I think if we're being honest with ourselves, we have more in common with these uncommitted disciples than we would like to admit. I know I certainly do. So let us look at these two would-be disciples and see what Jesus says to them and to us and consider what choices we want to make in response. So firstly, there's the teacher of the law. There is quite a lot that can be said about Jesus' interaction with the teacher of the law. Before we jump into looking at the conversation they had, let's first look at the man himself. A teacher of the law was someone who extensively studied the law and considered how it could be applied to daily life. In a world in which the ability to read and write was limited, teachers of the law were well educated. They were concerned with preserving the law and defending it. As such, to become a teacher of the law, one must have already studied for a considerable time under other rabbis. Apologies. Therefore, <laughs> it is possible that this teacher of the law was looking to establish a discipleship relationship with Jesus that allowed him to ver examine various rabbis and draw close to the one who was the most popular or the best equipped. So already this will leads us to wonder what this teacher of the law wanted to achieve by becoming Jesus' disciple. <clears throat> the teacher of the law appro approaches Jesus and says, Teacher! I will follow you wherever you go. Wherever you go. As the teacher of the Lord demonstrates, that's an easy thing to say, but it's much harder to live out in our daily life. Jesus' response to the teacher of the law highlights a number of things. Firstly, it is clear that to be Jesus' disciple is to accept the need or, or requirement for total sacrifice. Now, the teacher of the law may have thought he was sacrificing quite a lot already. He was po potentially setting himself up for a loss of popularity in some circles. As we know from some of the gospel stories, many teachers of the law clashed with Jesus and didn't agree with him. So by following Jesus, this teacher of the law would probably lose the respect of those who disagreed with Jesus. He was also choosing to return to being a disciple after he had already received the status of teacher of the law. 
This might have been potentially humbling, as he had to admit that he didn't know everything and he had things to learn from Jesus. So this might have been like taking a voluntary de demotion. So this man may have thought that he was that doing these things would be to sacrifice quite a lot. However, Jesus' words make it plain that these sacrifices are in an inadequate. He demands total sacrifice, complete surrendering to God. Jesus' response shows that to truly be a disciple of Jesus, we must be prepared to risk everything, even our most basic com security and comfort. He says, foxes have dens and birds have necks, nests, but, even the, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He announces that he has nowhere to lay his head, and thus neither do his followers. If the teacher of the law truly wanted to follow Jesus, he must be prepared to let go of even the most basic things, such as a place to rest his head. So what about us? Have we given God our total surrender? Have we sacrificed everything to him? It's easy to say, I surrender all, but to actually live it is hard. If God said to me tomorrow, I need to, you to give away a hundred pounds to the person in need that I will bring to your door. I'm not going to lie. I would hesitate. I would struggle and I would resist. Or imagine if God told you to go to the rough sleeper who begs for money and invite him into your house to have a safe place to stay, food to eat, clothes to wear. What would you do? We can say that we have surrendered everything to God but when that moment comes, when God calls us to act, so often we hesitate, prevaricate, or just outright refuse. How can we train ourselves, prepare ourselves to say yes when Jesus calls us to sacrifice something for him? Can you recommit yourself? and ask God to help you learn total sacrifice and surrender. Jesus' response to the teacher of the law also makes it clear that his ministry is to go to the places where he is most needed. The teachers of the law spent most of their time in synagogues and in the temple, either in undistracted study of scripture or by lecturing to their pupils in the temple courts. Yet Jesus makes it clear that if this teacher of the law wanted to follow him, he wouldn't be spending his time in the comfortable, familiar confines of the temple or the synagogues. Instead, they would be out in the community, ministering to the needy, the desperate, the outcast and the afflicted. To follow Jesus would mean he would have to get his hands dirty. He would regularly risk becoming unclean as he mixed with the dregs of society. Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but Jesus ministers away from the spiritual sanctuaries that we build, and he called his followers to move out of the spiritual comfort zones and get out into the community, to where the good news and hope is most needed. This is a message that Jesus still speaks to us today. We have created safe spaces for ourselves and shut ourselves away from the hurting world who needs to hear the message of hope we carry. Are we willing to go out into the community, to get dirty among those who we would typically avoid? Jesus calls us to minister, to be with those who most need to know him. Let us stop making excuses and instead follow Jesus' call to reach the hurting and the lost. Whoever it is that Jesus calls you to go to. Look out for who God places in, in your path this week. Seek out encounters with people who you would not normally interact with. Ask God sincerely 
to bring so someone that he wants you to connect with. Let us get out of our comfortable Christian bubbles and get into the hurting world. There is much more that can be said about this interaction that Jesus has with the teacher of the law, but I'm just going to mention one more thing. Jesus says, the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Now we know that Jesus didn't have a home, but he did have places to sleep. He was a guest in many homes, so physically he did find places to rest his head. But this has a spiritual interpretation. Jesus knew his home was not here on earth, but with his father in heaven. And he was here with a mission. He was not here to stay and enjoy a long earthly life. Jesus had a mission that kept him spiritually restless and homeless until he com completed that mission. Likewise, our eternal home is not here either. We have an eternal citizenship in heaven. And so this place is not our home. We are also given a mission that should make us spiritually restless. We have been given an urgent task that should leave us needing to do all we can to fulfil our part in the mission until we're called home. Do you have a sense of this, of this mission? Do you feel the urgent call to go and make disciples of all nations? That is the mission that we have been given. We know that our home is not here on earth. So, like Jesus, we also do not have a place to lay our head in a spiritual sense, because our home is with God in heaven. So now let's move on to the second person to approach Jesus. The second man is one I'll refer to as the family man. Note that when Jesus refers to him, it is as another disciple. It suggests that he has been following Jesus and, at least superficially, committing to him. He is not spoken of as a stranger or a member of the crowd, but as a disciple. And he comes to Jesus with a request. Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Now we might be tempted to think this is a fairly re reasonable request. Rituals around death have played a significant role throughout human history and it helped those left alive grieve and process death and loss. And this was especially true in Jesus, for Jews in Jesus' era. In Deuteronomy 5, the fifth commandment calls for the people of God to honour your father and mother. And this commandment was held in high priority, second only to the command to honour and worship God alone. As such, arranging the funeral for one's parent was seen as the final and highest way in which to honour honour that your parent the social and cultural norms called for the top priority to be placed upon these actions and nothing should stand in the way of them and yet jesus gives him a new priority follow me he makes it clear that following him should overcome any and all social cultural or familial obligations in this statement jesus equates himself with god as only honouring and serving God trumped the command to honour father and mother. This meant that the family man was left with a choice. Follow, follow the societal and cultural, cultural new, norms and tend to his father. Or trust that the one who had spoken was speaking the truth. To believe that Jesus truly is the son of God and take that leap of faith in following him above all else. What is it that battles to take pro top priority away from God in our own lives? What thing draws us away from following God's first and as first and ultimate priority? It may be that, like the family man, your priorities are divided by your family commitments. Or perhaps it is work, or your hob hobbies, or some other thing that gets in the way of following God above all. I think it is safe to say that we all struggle with the battle of keeping God as our top priority at every moment of our lives. So how can we keep refocusing our eyes on God 
What things help you to reprioritize your relationship with God over everything else? Jesus' response to the man's request for time to bury his father may seem really harsh, but is it really as harsh as it first appears? Let's take a look at uh, first century Jewish practices regarding death. When a father died, the children and other mourners would immediately gather and a funeral procession would take the body to the tomb prepared for the purpose as soon as possible. As such, there was no time for a morning son to take a moment to listen to Rabbi's teachings. For a week after the burial, the family would remain in mourning at home alone. So unless the man had died that very day, it's quite unlikely the man that man's father had just died, needing him to go and bury his father. It's possible that the man's father was not actually dead yet. And so this changes the man, the family man's request quite a bit. Now he's asking for time to spend with his family, enjoying the joys of life before finally committing to Jesus once he had had his time of enjoyment. Of course, there are many problems with this outlook. Not least because there are always excuses that we make that can draw us away from following God. His father would eventually have died, but then the excuses may have turned to, oh, I've just got married, I can't leave my wife so soon. And on and on the excuses would come. We have to choose to put Jesus above not just our obligations, but also above all our desires and pleasures. We have to choose to change our attitude. One commentator noted that the man's request to first go look after the family business contained the root of his problem. As it says in some of the translations, the man is quoted as saying, Lord, me first. When we put ourselves above God, when we put our own desires above God's will, then we will never truly become disciples. All we will ever be is a follower or believer, but never a disciple. To be a disciple of Jesus is to allow our attitude to change so that he becomes our biggest and most important desire. So we see in Jesus' interactions with both the teacher of the law and the family man, a demand for total submission. The cost of truly following Jesus is high. Are we willing to pay that cost? Are we willing to give God our total surrender? Are we prepared to minister to the suffering, to go carry the message of hope to the desperate around us? Do we feel that same spiritual unrest of Jesus that remains, reminds us that this place is not our home? Are we willing to put Jesus above all societal obligations? And are we willing to change our attitudes and recognise God should be our focus?